Uh, there we go. Thank you. Um, it's really nice to, to do a collaborative enterprise with um, a scientific basis. Um, and th this talk comes out of three kind of ideas or iterations of my life. Number one is I do lots of stuff with the uh, Florida Humanities Council, which if you're not a member, you probably should be. Um, it's, it's an important part of being a Floridian to learn about your culture and, and your lives here. Um, but I, I worked with them on a thing called Museums on Main Street, which is um, a program where they bring Smithsonian exhibitions to small underserved communities throughout the state of Florida, but also throughout the nation. And one of those was on water, and I was the lead state scholar on this water thing. So it, so it, it came out of that. It also came out of um, my book, which will be for sale afterwards on the Cross Florida Barge Canal. I have two left, so um, hopefully you'll, th that will go home with none. That would be nice. Um, and that, that story is about water and um, human interaction with it and the relationship of trying to change Florida to, to improve it by fixing it. And the third thing is I have the great pleasure of um, being involved in a summer program for the past three years and now this summer again um, at the University of Florida where we have a residential program for high school students for a week. They live in the dorms and then uh, ne the next week, because there's no rest, um, the next week a residential program for K through 12 teachers. They live in the hotel on campus um, and it's Hashtag Florida Water Stories. It's about Florida and water and using the human humanities to uh, allow you to understand the relationship of this state to water and where it was and where it's going because where it's going may not be where we want it to go. So um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'll take questions at the end. And um, if you don't like the talk, you can rescind your, your clapping that you gave me at the beginning. So, um, so Florida Water Stories starts with Florida and water. You know, and when we talk about the relationship of this entity, this geographic space that we call Florida, we understand that it is water related entirely, you know. Closest place, the furthest away place in the state is like 90 miles, and that happens to be where we live in Gainesville from, from the water. Um, and so water, not only from the Gulf, not only from the Atlantic, not only down here from Florida Bay, but also from the lakes and rivers and streams and marshes and springs, makes Florida the, the state that has the most water besides Alaska of any state in the Union. And that human relationship to that ecosystem makes us who we are. Here we are again, the many different areas of Florida, SS, super tropical, S, tropical, and then central, and then all the way up these different areas. But all of these areas are areas that are related to and associated with water environments. And again, Central Highlands, when we talk about Central Highlands, we talk about areas that are 100 feet above sea level. Okay, so, you know, that, that's not exactly high, but, um, but when you talk about that, you know, there are waterfall, there were waterfalls in the state, and there are waterfalls in the state that actually travel from 100 feet down to maybe 40 or 30 feet down. So there are waterfalls in this state, some of which existed in South Florida, which don't exist anymore because we have blasted them into oblivion. So, um, Florida's relationship to water not only starts with the environment above ground, we can relate it to the environment below ground. And this is this thing called the Florida Aquifer System, but it is called the Floridan, I guess after some guy named Dan who lived in Florida. So the Floridan, Ac uh, obviously it, it underlies everything under the state and throughout much of the southeast. Um, we knew it was there, but it was only discovered in the 1930s to be that large and only named in the 1950s. And this is this huge, basically underground sea of fresh water that underlays 
every part of the state. And on top of this is this layer of porous limestone. This is what allows us to get our percolated water and the springs that come up. So the Florida Aquifer is the key to understanding our relationship to, to water in the state. In the southeast, this is a surface aquifer, the Biscayne Aquifer in southeast Florida. It's you know where you get the water from there, but because it's a surface aquifer, it's very easily tainted by seawater, saltwater intrusion. So they've got difficulty getting water from the Biscayne Aquifer. Again, here we are again, Floridan Aquifer System, 100,000 square miles. All these cities get their water from there. Okay, you can see this. Again, Biscayne in South Florida. 1978, historians don't change much, so this has not changed much since that time. Again, potable water. And no potable water here, what well, means you have to go down very deeply in there to get the potable water to drink. Biscayne Aquifer, very difficult to maintain fresh water in there because of its surface location and because of how much we have taken out of it from all those people who live in what's called the Gold Coast. Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade counties. In the middle of the state, we have what looks like a beach. Okay? And at some point, this was Florida's coastline. This is the scrub, one of the last scrub areas in the world, and Florida has the largest area of native scrub in the entire world. Uh, and it is along the central Florida. So Florida was if you think Florida is a narrow peninsula now, 10,000 years ago, Florida was a pencil thin peninsula. And this is the remains of it, what's called the Central Florida Ridge, this area of sand and scrub, very difficult for people to live in. Anybody know why we have all this scrub area left here? You'll fail the test, but afterwards you won't. It's the Ocala National Forest, okay? The largest area of scrub in the world. And if you are familiar at all with um, one of the great authors in, in Florida history, Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, her books are about the Florida scrub. And the yearling takes place in the scrub, that very hard scrabble life lived by Ma and Pa Baxter and Jody Baxter. That's because of living in the scrub. And while the scrub exists along that central Florida ridge, much of Florida is this area. This area that we call the Everglades, this area that until the 19th century was considered to be uninhabitable and considered to be unpenetrable. And you know, when we think of the Everglades, we think of that wonderful national park at the tip of the state down here. But the Everglades really is an ecosystem that takes up almost half of the peninsula of Florida. It starts where everything starts in Florida, at Disney World, and travels southward to the Great Lake, and then flows ever so slowly, widely, and shallowly to Florida Bay. And you know, the Everglades is not a marsh, it's not a swamp, it's a wide, slow, shallow river, and we'll talk about that more later. Um, you can see what it looks like here, the Everglades, and you can see these things are canals that have been dug and dredged and changed. So the ecosystem of the Everglades has been changed dramatically, mostly in the past 70 years. And this is what it looks like. This is, these are hammocks, which are Highland in the Everglades, which means six to seven feet, maybe, above water. This is the sawgrass, the slow flowing, ever so slowly flowing, ever so shallowly flowing water that ends up in Florida Bay. Along the coastline of Florida, we have these trees. These are mangroves, red mangroves. We have white mangroves and black mangroves as well. Red mangroves are the closest to the coastline and they have the iconic, um, you can see here what they look like. They are very sensitive to changes in temperature and salinity and they are on the march. As water temperature rises, mangroves are taking over much of the coastline of Peninsula, Florida. So anybody know where Cedar Key is? Cedar Key, 30 years ago, you could look out the back of it 
not towards the Gulf, but back towards the marshes, unimpeded view. Today, that view is completely obscured by mangroves. They're beautiful, but it tells us how much things are changing in the past 30 years. These are cypress trees. Again, a water available associated tree, marshes, swamps, not only along the coastline, but interior. This is the largest marsh cypress tree in the world. This is a tree called the Senator, which is in a big tree park in Sanford, Florida. And you know, we can see this is it, the picture taken of it in the 1920s. This is picture taken of it in the last decade. Anybody know the story of the Senator? Burned to the ground by a drug-addled person in the last decade. Um, it is now a hollow shell of itself, and biologists, plant biologists, are attempting to clone the tree and restart it. It'll take another 2,500 years for it to grow to the height at which it was. When we think of Florida we most and water, we think of the Gulf, the Bay, and we think of the ocean. But Florida also has a significant number of riverine environments particularly the St. John's and its major tributary, the Ocklawaha, and the Apalachicola here in the Panhandle, and the Suwannee River up here, in, which, which goes from the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia and enters into the Gulf of Mexico in an area called the Big Bend. And, you know, rivers are generally area, uh, avenues of commerce, the Suwannee, not so much. It starts in a swamp. It ends in an area where there's not much population. But certainly the St. John's and the Apalachicola, they were the major avenues for people to come into Florida and to send their goods out of Florida into the 20th century. They're important waterways. This is what they look like. This is um, a sandbank on the edge of the Suwannee. This is the Ocklawaha River, the major tributary of the St. John's, and we'll talk about its story later on in the presentation. These rivers come from percolated water out of the Florida and atmosphere, at, aquifer through the, through the limestone that underlays Florida, and they come out in areas of springs. North Florida is the most uh, densely populated area of springs, first, second, third magnitude springs in the world. In fact, um, one of the newly established um, craft breweries in Gainesville is named First Magnitude after springs. Okay? The two largest springs in Florida are Silver Springs in Marion County and Wakulla Springs in Wakulla County, just south of Tallahassee. Um, this is Wakulla, um, preserved, ironically, by Ed Ball, um, one of the leading political uh, players in mid-20th century Florida. Not a nice man. He's the man who established the St. Joe's Paper Company. But he bought Wakulla as his private hunting preserve and so preserved the springhead. When he died, it was taken over by the state of Florida. It is now Ed Ball, Wakulla Springs State Park, and they've got a wonderful, they've got a wonderful lodge there. I've stayed there, it's nice. Not as nice as the cottages here, but it's pretty nice. This is Silver Springs, uh, also taken over by the state, is now Silver Springs State Park. It, along with Marine Land, were two of the largest um, uh, tourist attractions in Florida. Disney World uh, surpassed that, Sea World, Bush Gardens, all that. Silver Springs was a dying tourist attraction taken over by the state. But you can still ride over the spring head uh, in these glass bottom boats. The glass bottom boat was invented in Silver Springs in 1879 to go over the springs. Uh, these are smaller springs in north central Florida. This is Troy Springs here. This, this is Silver Glen Springs here. And you can see why people think that, you know, when they think about Florida, they may not think about the ocean, they may not think about the beaches, but they may think about the springs and how wonderful and iconic it is, especially in areas where I live in north central Florida. When we think of Florida, the place we go are the springs. Um, this is Devil's Den, a uh, spring, um, southwest of Gainesville, near Williston. You can climb into the ground and go swimming there. It's amazing. It's like 
entering the underworld. Um, another part of Florida's relationship to the, uh, to the sea are the series of barrier islands protected by sea oats. We have the tendency to believe that barrier islands are permanent and therefore we love to build on them. Um, barrier islands are temporary and they are always shifting. And you know, this is a barrier island on the southwest coast of Florida, which now has a very different shape after, after the hurricanes of, of 2004 reshaped this island dramatically. Oh, whoops. And when we talk about water in Florida, we want to talk about the coral reefs that exist um, in the far southern part of the state, in the south part of Dade County, but mostly in, in Monroe County um, and the Florida Keys. Florida is the only state in the Union in which, uh, a continental state in the Union which the, in which coral reefs exist. Beautiful stuff, John Pennekamp State Park um, in, in um, South Dade County, and then all along the Keys, this amazing um, subtropical Caribbean-like examination of sea life. And you can see here, you know, the Florida current, you can see where it is, and at some point it goes all the way up, maybe to almost to the Palm Beach County line. So Donald Trump can go snorkeling from Mar-a-Lago and, and see the coral reefs. So. All this is a natural introduction to Florida's relationship to its natural environment. And we're really going to start with European contact. And I use that word carefully because it's not European discovery, because discovery implies finding something new. And certainly it's not new because Native Americans lived here for thousands of years before Europeans came here. But Florida's environment has been radically reshaped by European context, so we're going to start there. Even though, you know, the assumption is Native Americans walked lightly on the land and their footprint wasn't there, Native Americans reshaped Florida, particularly in southwest Florida when the Calusa dug canals and, and um, made opportunities for, for association with the water through the way they reshaped the land there. And also, you know, much of interior Florida, when Europeans come, they find open grassland. Well, that's open because Indians used fire, and they used fire so they could easily hunt animals. So while we assume that, you know, natives did not bother the land, you know, Natives did bother the land, but not nearly as much as Europeans. And Europeans not only bothered the land, they bothered the water. And so when Europeans first come here, they're the Spanish. And certainly the first European to come here, we live in St. Augustine, we all know who this guy is, it's Ponce de Leon. And he comes in 1513, we all know why he's coming here, searching for the fountain of youth. So that, that's the water aspect of this, so we're done here. So, thank you. No, so, 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 you know, he's here for water, you know. And, he dies on a beach, shot by a Calusa arrow in southwest Florida. You know, he mortally wounded here, he goes to Cuba and dies. But, you know, the association of Florida with water begins with the Spaniards and that, that quest for water and its relationship to life. But it really doesn't start until the 19th century. And the 19th century sees Florida become part of the United States in 1821, um, becomes a state in 1845, and it is as much a frontier as any state in the Union. When we think about the frontier, we assume this line moving further westward, you know, from New Jersey to Ohio to the Mississippi to Kansas to Colorado and eventually to the Pacific. Well, they don't talk about the frontier also moving southward. And I would argue that Florida is as much a frontier state in 1900 as any state in the Union, a state that is still pretty unmapped and pretty untrammeled by humans except through water. And the only way to get around, this is a steamship on the St. John's. And water provides the only way to get in and out of the state. Railroads don't come until the 1890s. Roads really don't come until the 1920s. And water provides the way to get in and to get out. But also water provides the basis for Florida's two major industries agriculture, and tourism. And tourism is based almost exclusively on Florida's water, okay? You know, today we have Disney World. Disney World could be located in Nebraska, right? Florida, Disney World has nothing to do with Florida. But until Disney World comes along, all of Florida's tourism was related to water. 
Silver Springs, right? Silver Springs. The, the rivers themselves, the heart line on the Oklawaha River, which traveled on the river, people loved the river, went to Silver Springs. People loved it. Okay? But water's great, but you can't live on it. You can't live in it. So what do we have to do? If we want to live in Florida, we got to get rid of the damn stuff. We got to get rid of it. So much of Florida's relationship to water until maybe the last 20 years is there is too much of it and we want to turn water into land. And certainly that starts with this man, Hamilton Diston. Like so many of us, he comes from the north, okay? Like so many of us, he comes from the north looking for something good in this state. And what good in this state he's trying to find is money, okay? And in 1881, the state of Florida is broke, okay, after the Civil War. They're looking for, they're looking for a, a, a sugar daddy. And Hamilton Diston says, here I am. He gives the state of Florida $1 million, the state of Florida gives him 4 million acres of land. Much of that land is uninhabitable. So what's he going to do? Well, he's going to dredge it, he's going to ditch it, he's going to reshape the land and turn it into something that's habitable. And so Hamilton Diston, the Diston Purchase, as it's known, you know, begins this idea that people can reshape the state of Florida and turn all this watery land into land that is usable. Right, now, he manages to drain 348,000 acres. All right? That's a lot of land, right? Anybody here got that much? No, okay. But how much did he get? Four million. So 348,000 is a drop in the bucket compared to how much he thought he could drain. So his attempt is a failure. He goes back to Philadelphia and like so many other people, you know, failing in Florida, the assumption is he goes into his bathtub again, there's that water angle, and shoots himself. Now, we're not sure whether that's a true story. There's all sorts of stories whether he does or doesn't shoot himself, but it's a great story, so we'll go with it, right? So Hamilton Diston is a failure at dredging, but that doesn't mean the idea dies with him. It means that the next generation and the next generation after that will say, Distant had a good idea, he just didn't do it well enough. He just didn't have enough money. He just didn't have enough fancy machinery. So the next person who really feels that he can drain Florida and turn it into habitable land is the governor from 1905 to 1909, one of the great names in Florida history, Napoleon Bonaparte Broward, Broward County. You know, and here's Broward, and Broward's idea is to drain the Everglades, turn it into habitable land. And he, and he you know, develops a series of canals that he's going to build from what he considers to be the linchpin of the Everglades, the Great Lake, Lake Okeechobee. And he's going to build the New River Canal. He's going to dig the Miami Canal. He's going to dig the St. Lucie Canal. He's going to widen the Caloosahatchee River and make the Everglades more habitable. But once again, he doesn't do nearly what he thought he could. So Broward's attempt to drain South Florida and turn it into habitable land is a failure. But once again, the lesson that people learn is we need more money, better machinery, not that the idea itself is, is wrong. And certainly the next slide tells us, you know, I love political cartoons. And you know, when we talk about the demise of newspapers, one of the great things that we're losing are political cartoons. Because you can't get political cartoons on the internet. Uh, and they're just so wonderful. So this is a great, you know. Where are we gonna get the money from? Uncle Sam. And I think this is an important thing. You know, Floridians hate the government. We hate the government. Damn, you know, intrusion, take away our slaves. We hate the government. But yet the government's the only place that has the money. So here's Miss Florida and you know, where are we going to get the money from? Uncle Sam, okay? But, as the next slide tells us, right? I'm not going to say a word. See, all these people come down here in the 1920s hoping to get land. It doesn't pan out. But we're draining and we're dredging. You know, we're Port Everglades. Most of the harbors here, the only really natural harbor we have is Tampa Bay. Jacksonville Harbor, 
dredged completely. And again, irony, the person who is in charge of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers dredging in Jacksonville is the guy who fought in the Battle of Olusti in the Civil War on the Union side. Okay, so the irony of the federal government being involved. Miami's harbor dredged out. So all these things, government intervention. And reclaiming the Everglades, you know, progressive Florida. We're going to reclaim it. You can see these. And you guys, I don't want to say this, but you guys are all old enough to know Rube Goldberg, right? Rube Goldberg contra uh, contraptions for sure designed to dig, di dig these dig ditches, get the land up, put dikes up, and dredge out the land and drain it. And tied into this is why we're doing this. And this is maybe, the, it's a little hard to see, but the best line in Florida history, and this we got a lot of land, manless land, land without many people, right? And of course, you know, sexist, manless, you know. Landless man, manless land for the landless man. All those people in New York, in Chicago, who are living in an apartment, what do they need? They need land. And where can they get it? They can get cheap land that is uninhabited here in Florida as long as we dredge it and ditch it and get that water the hell out of there. Okay. So this is what the Everglades Drainage District, by the 1930s, this is what we have done. All these are artificial water entities leading out of the lake, draining into, these, into the Atlantic Ocean here, draining into the Gulf of Mexico here, and basically cutting off much of the water supply of the Everglades. So as early as the 1930s, the Everglades are at some level thirsting for water because we have reshaped the hydrology of South Florida. Reshaped it with machines like this, okay? Dredging and diking and reshaping the land. Building things like the Tamiami Trail, which allows people to drive from Tampa all the way down to Naples, then across the state. Basically, it's a giant dike with a road on top of it. And what does that do? It stops the water supply from going to the Everglades south of that dike. And the Everglades, again, now we have more and more thirsting for water in that south part of the state. Dredging again, and much of this dredging takes place around the lake because as we build around the lake, we begin to take some of the natural environment out of there and replace it with agriculture. And agriculture needs a separate water supply, but it also needs protection. The lake would, as part of the natural flow, the lake would periodically overflow. That water would flow southward. But if water overflows and there are people there, and there's agricultural land, the agricultural land is gonna flood, the people are gonna die. So we begin to build a dike around Lake Okeechobee, again, cutting off South Florida from that natural supply of water. And here it is again, Hoover Dike, built in 19, from 1930, and the last part of Hoover Dike is finally completed in 1962. Herbert Hoover's last public appearance is in Florida to, to put the final thing down for his namesake dyke. Again, here we go. Rube Goldberg at his finest dredging these things out. They can dredge 165,000 cubic yards in one month, getting that land, getting it ready. And what are we doing? Well, by the 1940s, we're dredging so we can do this, so we can build land and housing and so that everybody can have what? Waterfront property, because that's what we all want. And you know, the key year in Florida relating to water is actually two years, 1947, 1948. 1947, we finally realized that the Everglades are a place worth saving, and we build and establish Everglades National Park. Harry Truman comes to Florida to dedicate the park. And the man who is considered the father of the Everglades Park, Ernest Coe, almost doesn't go. He has to be convinced to go to the dedication because he says, this is not my idea of a park. My idea of a park was three times as large. But what we've done is we've reshaped Florida and all this stuff now is open for penetration for people to live. And this park really won't do what it's supposed to do. But he's convinced to go there and the park is in existence. The same year, 
This woman. Anybody know who this woman is? No. It's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Okay. The mother, if Ernest, if Ernest Coe is the father of the Everglades, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas is the mother of the Everglades. And in 1947, she writes a book that profoundly reshapes our entire vision of what the Everglades is. It's not a swamp. It's not a marsh. It's Everglades, River of Grass. And this is a remarkable book. Anybody ever read this book? It's, it's remarkable. Okay. The first chapter is amazing. Starts off, there is no place on earth like the Everglades. The last chapter is incredible. Talks about what we are doing to this precious resource, and if we don't change our ways, this resource will die. You can read the first chapter, read the last chapter, the rest of it, just ignore the middle. Because it's, 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 it's not that good. But the book is amazing. It's amazing. But a year after the park is established, a year after she writes Everglades River of Grass, the federal government gets involved with something that's bureaucratically called the Central and Southern Florida Project. You know, it sounds like something someone would do for middle school, right? But the Central and Southern Florida Project is the culmination of the ideas of Diston and uh, Broward and all those other people who thought they could reshape Florida and fail. Now we have the technology, but more importantly, we have the will, but most importantly, we have the money. The federal government is going to do this through the Army Corps of Engineers. We're flush with cash after World War II. We can do anything. We beat Hitler. We beat the Japanese. We're the, we're the greatest power on earth. We certainly can fix Florida. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to reshape how the Everglades water flows. Here's how it historically flows. Here's how it's going to flow now, through all these canals. Started by Broward, now widened, deepened, changed. We have built a huge area south of the lake called the EAA, Agri um, Everglades Agricultural Area. And we build structures like this all through South Florida. So if you drive to South Florida on the turnpike, you will see all these structures along here, every one with the wonderfully named parts of by the Army Corps of Engineers, C-27, C-232, C you know, they C standing for canal. And all these things are built there to reshape and to basically to protect South Florida from periodic drought and flooding. And also to ensure that we have this. This is what grows up on the south shore of Lake Okeechobee, American sugar. Clewiston, Florida. Clewiston, Florida's nickname becomes America's sweetest town. And especially after 1960, these sugar fields go into heavy production. 1960, because that's the year that Castro takes over Cuba. We no longer have access to Cuban sugar. We've got to find a, a way to, to, uh, to sate our sweet tooth. And we find South Florida is the perfect place. And we reshape the water areas of South Florida in order to do that. This is a housing community in the Everglades. This is Miami Lakes. And this is interesting because Miami Lakes is on land that was owned by a man named Cap Graham, a guy who comes down to Florida from, from um, Michigan, has, a first, has first a sugar plantation that doesn't succeed, turns it into a dairy farm, but pretty quickly figures out it's better to get rid of the dairy on most of the land and develop the rest of it as this development called Miami Lakes, which basically is in the Everglades, and of course everybody's got waterfront property. The interesting thing is, Bob Graham, uh, Cap Graham's son is none other than Governor Bob Graham, who becomes one of the leading advocates for environmental protection in the state of Florida, which is why history is wonderful for its ironies. And this is water in the Everglades in the late 1960s. Late 1960s, we're doing great stuff. We're going to the moon. So if we're going to the moon, we certainly can build a new airport for Miami. And Miami needs a new airport. Where are we going to build it? We're going to build it in the middle of the Everglades, 60 miles from Miami, 60 miles from Fort Myers, connected to both of them by monorail. And, get, and they actually talked to the people at Disney to see if they could get a, how they could develop a monorail to do this. Everyone thought this was a good idea. Tomorrow, the future, positive. It is eventually stopped by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, but also these three people. 
Luna Leopold, who's the son of Aldo Leopold, the great, uh, basically, developer of the idea of ecology. Joe Browder, who was a, a, a Miami TV reporter, started talking about this story on the news, quit his job um, um, as a reporter to become a full-time environmental activist to stop the building of this. And Nathaniel Reed, who died last year, um, he's the first um, Florida cabinet officer involved in, in in uh, environmental protection. And basically the four of those people, these three guys and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, stop the building of the Miami jet port. It is the largest civil works project in American history, not completed, along with another one from Florida, which we'll talk about. So this is what the Everglades was like. This is what it's like now. So now, today, we've got all these huge plans to try and fix it because Basically, we've fouled up the plumbing, and when you foul up the plumbing in your house, you don't want to do it yourself. You got to call a plumber. So the plumber is the people involved in this thing called SERP, Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, Restoration Program, and we're going to try to fix it. But the problem is it's tough to fix it when you've got 8 million people living here who are used to the fact that their water is being managed by government entities. Again, this is what we've done. And this is what we've done. This is part of the Everglades program north of the lake. This is the Kissimmee River, 1965. This winding, na narrow, wonderful, pristine, rather pristine river. And that's not what we want. So what do we do? Well, we spent $5 million and we turned that into this so that we wouldn't have flooding, so that we could manage it, and we give it a new name. This is Kissimmee River, this is C-38, okay? So keep in mind what we've done here. We've taken this, right, and we turned it into this. So just don't fall asleep yet, because we'll, we'll, we're coming to something else. This is another part of our idea to change Florida. This is the Cross Florida Barge Canal an idea to build a canal across the state from Yankee Town on the west coast to Jacksonville on the east coast using the Withlacoochee River, the Ocklawaha, and the St. Johns River and cutting across Florida. Started in the 1930s, it was stopped because of fears of saltwater intrusion. Started again in the 1960s, built with things like the Crusher Crawler, destroying River Forest of the Ocklawaha, which you guys saw before, crushing this. And building this across the state. And building this across the state. 1971, this was stopped by activists in Gainesville, led by um, Marjorie Carr, who was a faculty spouse, because in that time period, she couldn't get an academic job as a woman. So. This leads to one of the more interesting water stories. This is part of the canal behind a dam that is built on the Ocklawaha River called the Rodman Dam. And the Rodman Dam has a reservoir behind it called Rodman Reservoir. Or if you really like the dam, you call it Lake Ocklawaha. And if you really hate the dam, you call it the impoundment. And it has to be artificially managed because it's an artificial environment. So every four years, they have to lower the water level to let the lake breathe. And it reveals all these stumps, this drowned forest. Normally, the water level, this is above there, OK? And this drowned forest is the result of trying to build this canal and this across the state. And every four years, this is a spring run. And this is a spring called Cannon Springs. 90% of the time, this spring is covered by the reservoir's waters. When the water level of the, of the reservoir is lowered, you can have access by this spring run off the Ocklawaha River to this incredible spring. And I had the privilege of being involved in, in going on an expedition that made a documentary movie about what these springs were. It's called Lost Springs. And Margaret Tolbert, a Gainesville artist, uh, brought people down there and she drew these wonderful pictures of what this looks like. I mean, this could either be the spring itself or it could be Tolbert's 
drawings of it, but it tells us what we have done to the Florida environment and the destruction of water for something which never has occurred because the canal is dead. Okay? And when we talk about Florida and water, we can talk about three women who are really instrumental in changing our perception of what Florida is like. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, as we saw before. Marjorie Harris Carr, this is in the Valley of the Ocklawaha, and her stopping of the Cross Florida Barge Canal. And Marjorie Canan Rawlings, who, although she writes The Yearling, also writes a book called Cross Creek, where she lives. And you know, it's about her relationship to the land and to the water. And it's, it's, it's her story of a Florida that, even when she was dying in the 1950s, was rapidly changing. And it is a story about you know, how Floridians can live in harmony with the land and in harmony with the water. So I think these three people are profoundly important in helping us to understand a new water ethic for the state. Okay? And we changed water too. 1878, somebody goes to the New Orleans World's Fair, sees these plants, thinks they're beautiful, brings them back to the St. John's River, puts them in a pond there, and within 10 years, water hyacinths have covered the entire St. John's River. You know, artificial. So what do we do? Well, now we've, we've screwed up the river. We've screwed up the river, so what do we do? We import fish to eat the, eat the water hyacinths, and that screws up the environment even more, okay? 1965, another invasive plant, hydrilla. And you can see hydrilla clogs our waterways. How do we deal with that? Pesticides. We, propellers that go through there, they do this, they bring it from lake to lake. You can see almost the entire peninsula and panhandle of Florida have hydrilla there. And the state of Florida spends millions of dollars every year to try to eradicate this. And then you can't talk about Florida and water without talking about hurricanes. Hurricanes have been here forever, but hurricanes affect Florida in very different ways now because there are just so damn many people and just so damn many buildings and just so much damn infrastructure. This is the 1926 hurricane which ended the Florida land boom and actually put Florida in depression three years before the Great Depression. This is Henry Flagler's railroad, Hallover Inlet in Miami. No trains are getting through there. Okay. Great 1926 hurricane, as I said, puts an end to um, the Florida land boom. But Florida boosters say what? Once in a hundred year occurrence, come on back down. Two years later, the Great Palm Beach hurricane, the Great Okeechobee hurricane, 3,500 people die in this hurricane. Most of them poor black migrant workers working in the vegetable and sugar fields of Belle Glade and South Bay down here and Pahokee south of the lake. Um, if you've ever read Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God, this is the penultimate event in here. And here are the coffins of those people who are died in that event. But Floridians have short memories. 1920s, 1930s, not much hurricane activity. 1940s, not much hurricane activities. 1950s, not much hurricane activity. I mean, there was significant, but not like catastrophic. In fact, in 1950, great name, Hurricane King, because at that point they're giving army names, Alpha, Bravo, whatever, down to King. So 1953, they finally start naming hurricanes after women. 1978 is only when they start naming it after men too. And 1992, that changes with Andrew, which comes through South Florida like a buzzsaw, okay? Category five, even though it's got here, it's pretty narrow, just through South Dade County. If it had gone 15 to 20 miles further north, a terrible, horrific storm would have been a catastrophe of the highest magnitude as it was, it looks like tornadoes, you know. But again, Floridians have short memories. The positive result of this are significantly more stringent uh, building standards, you know, which help a lot, but Florida continues to build. And I remember this, 2004, and you know, these, we're in Gainesville, we're 90 miles from the coast. We got hit 
twice. People died in Gainesville from this hurricane. Now, you, you can die from storm surge. That didn't happen. You can die from rain. That didn't happen. Wind. Wind is what killed people in Gainesville. Big trees falling over. This is Hurricane Ivan, and you can see, this is what happens when you build on those assumedly permanent barrier islands. And guess what? Within 10 years, this was all rebuilt to be destroyed by Hurricane Michael last year. This is the results of Hurricane Michael. These are pictures taken last year by um, the great Gainesville photographer, John Moran, who graciously let me have these for my, for my talk, and you can see the results of that hurricane. And this is what we continued to do, build islands in the Gulf Stream, uh, I'm sorry, build islands in the Gulf uh, intercoastal, build islands in the Atlantic intercoastal, because it's near the water. And you can see, you know, here's the natural, these are natural buffers. This wetlands, this mangrove area, protects lands from hurricanes. This has a big sign that says, hit me, I'm here. Okay. And again, here we are again. This is over South Florida. This is over South Florida again. This is Southwest Florida. Okay? And this is what happens when you build like this, you end up building like this. This is the great Florida recession of 2007, 2008. We got waterfront property. We only got one house built. Okay? And for a while, Florida growth stopped. And, and nature took a breather. But as we rebuild, we're back to that same building again. And when we talk about water, an area of Florida that is pretty much under-examined is the Panhandle, and particularly an area down here, okay? Water wars that deal with, anybody know the town that's at the end of the Apalachicola River? I can just make it up and you wouldn't know, so it's, all right. It's a town called Apalachicola, okay? And Apalachicola produces some of the world's finest oysters. And oysters have to have the correct water temperature and salinity to have that wonderful flavor. And that salinity is being changed as the rivers that flow into the Gulf right here are being utilized for water by that giant up north Atlanta. And Florida and Alabama and Georgia have been fighting over water removal from these rivers for over 20 years in the courts. This is Apalachicola Bay. This is oyster fishing or oyster harvesting, 1898. Okay. This is oyster harvesting last decade of the, 19, of the 20th century, first decade of the 21st century, still using rather primitive methodology. And last year, Supreme Court sides with Florida. Okay. Guess what? Georgia appealed, so we still have significant questions as to, and what, Appalachia Call has 3,000 people. Atlanta has 3,000 people in one building. So who's gonna win this battle, right? And while that issue, the water wars over Apalachicola um, provide a window into some of the things that are going on. Certainly, the state of the springs in north central Florida provide another window. And John Moran, whose photographs I showed you before, uh, made a living taking iconically beautiful pictures of the north central Florida landscape, particularly springs. He's now changed that and become like a Cassandra, saying, this is what our springs have become, and if we don't do something, they will die. Yeah. And these are two pictures taken 10 years apart, okay? You can see how much the spring, and, and Itchitoqueney, anybody been to Itchitoqueney? It's an incredible place. And I take my students there from South Florida, and they are amazed. And I say, it's only a bit what it was like even 15 years ago. So if you bring your children here in 10 years, it may not even be as nice as this. This is, this is Troy Springs, which you saw before, for a variety of reasons, over pumping, nitrates in the water, pollution. And there we are. 
This is White Springs, which was one of the, the leading um, health resorts in the early part of the 20th century. People would, would come up here and jump and, and into the water. You can see how much lower the water level is here. Basically, because of overpumping, springs are producing uh, less than 50% of what they were producing less than 20 years ago. One reason is spring water is still beautiful. And we pump it out of there for that. Coral reefs are dying at a level almost unprecedented to the point that, you know, less than 10% of the coral reefs, and you can see how quickly they have been degraded in the past, just in our lifetime. And this is our answer to the Everglades. Once again, a Rube Goldberg-like drawing of how to fix something. You know, if you can figure this out, you should be a scientist and not a historian, because I can't figure this out. But this is how we're going to restore the Everglades with all this stuff. It takes a lot of money. There's a lot of stakeholders, all of whom have different points of view. We have to take into account the Seminole Indians that live there. We've got to take into account the, the Everglades National Park. We've got to take into account um, agricultural interests. But we also have to take into account all those millions of people that live along the East Coast and also along the West Coast, right? And once again, we don't have to say anything. Political cartoons say it all for us. All right, remember C-38? Well, we decided that C-38 was a disaster, an economic and environmental disaster. So while we spent $2 million to channel the Kissimmee River and turn it into C-38, we spent almost a billion dollars to get rid of C-38 and rechannel the river. So this is what it was like when it was C-38. This is what it's like now, okay, which is what it was like before. And the crazy thing is, even the most ardent environmentalists thought this land, which was this, okay, would take years to become natural again. It took less than two years for it to kind of regrow and become a natural environment, which is pretends very positive things in a story that has not many positives. And there it is again. Okay, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like now. Okay. Positive story. And positive story is this is the Everglades taken in 2016. And I mean, you look at it, it looks beautiful. It looks natural. It looks pristine. And that's the glass half full story that, you know, Significant parts of Florida's water environment still are naturally beautiful, but Florida's waters are incredibly imperiled for a variety of reasons, one of which happens to be watering our lawns, okay? And significant proportions of, of Florida's water goes to maintaining that iconic part of suburbia. And this is a slide I added for, a, I gave this talk in, in um, uh, Port St. Lucie um, about a month ago, and I, the day before the talk, I was walking across the UF campus. It was raining out, hence this. It's raining, right? And what's going on? The damn sprinklers are on while it's raining. So just, you know, so. Um, while that's problematic, golf course. Golf courses are unbelievably heavily problematic both for watering and also for the incredible amount of fertilizer and nutrients that go into making those golf courses so beautiful and lush, okay? And much of the problems of the Ocklawaha and Silver Springs Basin has to do with golf courses and all those people who want to play every day on the 67,268 golf courses that exist in the villages, right? So, but also agriculture. And agriculture is still among the largest industries in Florida, which is hard to believe in a state that, and agriculture is an incredible user of water. And certainly parts of the University of Florida, particularly IFAS, which I, at some level I have significant problems with, but IFAS is really working on getting agriculture to use water more efficiently. Okay, that drip irrigation systems as opposed to things like this, which waste, you know, 80 to 90% of this water is wasted, okay? 
okay? And if we can get big agriculture to use water more efficiently, we will have more water for, for nature, okay? And certainly we see erosion building on places which we never should have built in the first place. This is the results of Hurricane Matthew. I think this was taken actually in Flagler County. So you can see what's happening here, right? And maybe the, the most iconic visions of what's happening is the algae blooms from Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee was getting extraordinarily high. As it gets high, we can't release water in its natural flow over the agricultural lands. The dike is still there holding it in. What do we do? We pump water out through the canals to the Atlantic Ocean. We pump water out of the canals to the Gulf of Mexico. And Lake Okeechobee is an incredibly polluted area, much of which from um, fertilizers, both from north of the lake and also from big sugar south of the lake. And you get this this horrific, and this is horrible, because you come to Florida to go fishing, you come to Florida to go boating on the water, and this is what you come here for. This, this is where it's out in um, the Lake Okeechobee into the St. Lucie Canal on the east side. This is on the west side, but you get this. Water that is so thick that you can actually walk on it. Again, these were taken by John Moran last year. This is on the west coast. This is on the East Coast. You know, and again, we're going to spend millions of dollars to try to clean this up. Then there was the red tide last year. Okay? And you know, interesting assumptions about what causes red tide. Scientists are still not sure. And certainly, you know, we're quick to blame agricultural interests, human interaction. But history is interesting. Right? This is the great red tide outbreak. Last year, awful, you don't want, but look at this. 1955, right? Florida's population is less than 5 million. Today it's over 20 million, less than 3 million actually. Red tide dates back to 1880s. Booklet gives fact and fiction, okay? So red tide has been around for, as a naturally occurring phenomenon, but exacerbated by human interaction for sure. And you know, we're not sure what's happening this year. But the great elephant in the room is not red tide or algae blooms or even the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. The great water elephant in the room is sea level rise. And the assumptions if, if it rises six feet, Fort Lauderdale will be right there. Gainesville will be close to being waterfront property and we've got big problems, okay? This is where, what it would be. You know, Flamingo, all, all the keys, gone. Turkey Point nuclear plant, gone. All the way up here, all the way, right? Scary, scary stuff. But, shit could be worse. Again, this is John, this is John Moran again. Trouble in paradise, key environmental issues, you know, again. 22 million people here, but again, we got water, got water, but trouble in paradise, right? Trouble in paradise, in spite of all that, I'll end with that. Thank you. <laughs>